hey everybody come out over here because you probably haven't seen anything quite like this before i'm here with terry wachowski the president of karasov great to see you again Hi, of great course to see you again and we're standing inside of a cyber truck and the reason we're able to do that is you guys pulled the battery out of this thing <laughs> already right. yeah it's uh, well welcome welcome to the heart of karasov we've been out in the parking lot and driving around but this is where the the heavy lifting happens um, and, and now we're in the process of disassembling this cyber truck and we'll be doing all the analysis, the design. Why is the design the way it is? What's the benefit? What's the cost? How does it all add up at the end of the day and what makes for a great design? So we're, we're right in the middle of that and I thought it'd be a great time. Uh, we talked last time about um, the steer by wire. And so before we took that system out of the vehicle, I wanted to make sure you got a chance to see it in position, in situ, and uh, kind of see it there. And then later, after we get it all disassembled, you can come take another look at a little At closer. all the parts laid all out parts and everything like out. that. Sure, but sure. So was it a hassle getting the battery out of here or what? Yeah, much like the Model Y, uh, the Cybertruck followed suit and the body in white doesn't have a floor. Now for 100 years, when we made bodies, they had a floor. You know, when, uh, if you had a body group, they made a body that was structurally sound took all the loads that it would experience. It gave you environmental security, it made you warm when you're cold and you know, cool when you're hot and, and safe in crash and, and quiet and smooth. Uh, and when you did that, you believed you had a place to place your feet. I mean, there was a floor. Uh, with uh, the integration uh, activities that, that were really kind of a paradigm that was uh, broken by Tesla on the Model Y, is the body in white has no floor. It simply takes the top of the battery, and then when they install the battery pack, it becomes the floor of the vehicle. Real smart move. It's and then they put the seats move. and the, the carpeting and the center console on top of all that. It goes up Even before one it's unit. installed. Right, so yeah. So it just makes assembly that much yeah, easier. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, the top of the battery had to be made a little thicker in order to, to do that double duty, but uh, still, in, it, they enjoy a great efficiency gain by doing that. So right. uh, here's where we are. Uh, in this case, uh, Taking the batteries out of these things is a challenge. It's always a discovery. How are they held in there? And, and just, the, just the bulk of it. How do we take it down safely and all these things? Uh, actually, this one came out quite easily. Hmm. Uh, I shouldn't say easy. <laughs> I got you. It's all relative. It's all, but it was straightforward. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the fasteners were, were quite uh, clear. And, and they took them out. Uh, and we've got the battery over here. I'll give you a quick shot of that before I leave here today. Uh, we'll, we'll do a deeper dive on that. Yeah, uh, for another time, another when time. We, come, we come back to that. But you know what's cool when you, you, you pull all this out is you start to see some of the castings that are right into the, the passenger compartment. Tesla's taking the castings further and further, as we'll see on this truck. Uh, here, the rear seat, the structure for the rear seat is a casting. So they've, they've taken that rear casting and now they've extended it here with a, a rear seat. And, and Terry, as well what, as the but, front seat. Yeah. The front seat's also on castings. On castings. Instead of just a stamping, which is a typical roll for stamping for a seat track, mm -hmm. they're castings. And uh, it looks like they're painting it or coating it in some way yeah, because I've seen some of their other castings and it's just coarse aluminum. Yeah, no, the, uh, from stem to stern, you'll see that. Uh, that Why apply. do you think they're coating it? Uh, corrosion, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Just but it's, it's, it's just the, yeah. and, and then the other thing you were telling me before, any place I see one of these blue connectors, that means it's 48 volts. Yeah, one of the really you know, things we're very curious about here, and we really want to do a good job of uh, analyzing and documenting, is the 48 volt architecture. And uh, we found out that they did something pretty clever in that all the circuitry that is 48 volts has this blue uh, the, the wiring harnesses have blue stripes on them, uh, the connectors have blue. The high voltage stuff is, is the orange, the typical don't cut here mm -hmm. kind of a thing. Um, and so that, that's, you can see where that uh, comes in. We are uh, kind of challenged that we have to go deep into virtually every electrical system because it's not all 48 volts. Interesting. Some of it remained at 12 volts. And so, and so very, because the perception out there is it's all 48. Uh, yeah, and it was my perception. Yeah, 48, boom. You know, it's, it, they swallowed the pill and did it. And it's like, well, yeah, they swallowed the pill and did it, but not everywhere. So we're going to do a deep inventory, which systems are, uh, which ones aren't, and then how do they step down that 48 well, volts down to a, a 12 volt legacy system. Sure, but I mean, you know, I gotta believe there's some things like a dome light or whatever. You don't need 48 volts for a dome light, right? Or, you know, a vanity uh, mirror light type of thing. So yeah. 
we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find it out and we'll document where they did and, and, and where they didn't. But what I'd really like to uh, concentrate on with you right now, at least the steering, and show you what Let's we've been that. able to see from here and then kind of where our analysis will take us from here. Okay. okay, so tell me about the steering a little bit. Well, as we mentioned, you know, when we went for a drive together, it is steer by wire. So there is no actual connectivity between this steering wheel and those steering wheels. It's important to remember that when you're in an automobile, your life depends on four friction patches the size of your palm. That's the contact makes, with the tires that, and the road. The tire to the road. That's what makes you go, that's what makes you stop, and that's what makes you turn. And you get a vector, and it's a function of your normal load and the coefficient of friction. And you get this much vector, and that's all you get. And if you go beyond that, you, you skid, you slide. So it's, you know, automotive uh, ride and handling engineers are controlling that all the time. In steering, you know, we put this force into, this, into the tires and we can turn the vehicle. Uh, but in the Cybertruck, we've got a, a steer-by-wire. So we're typically uh, connected from the steering wheel right out to the corners, right to the tires, mechanically. Not now. Now you are separated. So what you have is uh, you have this. We, we talked before about the shape of the steering wheel, and some people love it, and others find it odd. Uh, I, I thought the other day about backing up a trailer with this. Uh, I would shoot myself. Uh, it, hard enough to back up a trailer, let alone trying to figure out where's the wheel while you're doing it. But uh, so we want to see what, how do they do it? Because when you do the steer by wire, you have a uh, what we call a DFMAA challenge. What's, what's my design? Failure mode effect. DFMA, design uh -oh. failure mode assessment. Or That's right. Uh, uh, so you really have to design a system like this to say it, it can't fail. I can't have a single point failure that would allow the system to fail. Because it has to steer. If it moves, you better be able to stop it and be able to steer it. So since we're not connected, how do you go about doing that? And there will be... Uh, We'll, we'll be able to see some of the strategies on, on how they did that. Okay, one thing that you were pointing out to me before we get going is this electric motor under yeah. the dashboard. Here, could we go up a little bit here? A, a little bit better, better view. We'll just yeah, the right. That's good. Thanks, Derek. John, typically the steering wheel, you know, through the column is connected to the steering gear, which connects to the tie rods, to the, to the tires. It's connected by a shaft that we refer to as a, an intermediate shaft. So this connects the steering wheel to the, the rack and pinion or the steering. So this came off some other vehicle this that you did uh, tear uh, down. Another on. vehicle, we just happened to grab it to make yeah. a comparison. This right. is uh, what, what, typical. Now this would be connected right to the steering column. Then it has to pass through the front of the dash. Well, when you pass through the front of the dash, that's not incidental. We need to have a seal around that. We have to have a gasket. We have to have bolts and fasteners to attach it. And we have to have a bearing in there because this is, has to rotate through that seal. So it's a bit of a, a challenge. Then the, uh, the steering wheel is never in line with, with the steering mechanism. It's always it's offset. Always off. Because you got to package so much right. other stuff. So you have to have a means of, of bringing that torque through an angle. And so here you can see they do it with a, a simple uh, U-joint type arrangement. And if you arrange these in the appropriate orientation, you can get constant velocity. Turn this, and this will turn at the same speed. Get them off, and you get it's lumpy. It's like a U-joint on your socket. You know, it goes up fast, slow down. So that's uh, part of the, the challenge of making the intermediate shaft. Plus, the front is, the steering is attached to the chassis. This is attached to the body. They have relative motion when you hit bumps and such things. So these shafts have to allow these things to have different motion. So they have a telescoping mechanism. So there's splines in here and grease and sometimes bearings to allow these to stroke. And then of course you have to seal them also. So though it's just an intermediate shaft, it's not a simple thing. It has to be done well. And then it has to be uh, error-proof such that when it gets assembled, it can't get misassembled. The last thing you want to do is put this on wrong. <laughs> Bad things would happen. So, so you want to poke a yoke at it so it only goes in one so way, the right way. That's right. So the shape isn't circular. 
it can only go one way. There's usually a slot that when you put the bolt through to secure this, it's going through actual groove in the mating part, so it just can't come off. So that's the, that's the typical uh, design. With the steer by wire, that just stops. That column is just as, you know, a shaft on bearings to allow you to turn it, and, and that's all. Now, this is different than most steering wheels in that it can only go this far. You can't just spin it all the way around. So that, that's really all you get. Now, since you're steering by wire, you can dial that in. You can calibrate that any way you want to, so that, that's fine because you get good, good feel. But interesting, if you look here, this motor, its sole purpose would appear to be to simply give you feedback into the wheel. Which is important. Yeah, today you want to feel connected. So if the roads are jittery, you want to know that. If it's a you know, bumpy road or I might lose traction, you know, you feel that. How is the vehicle tracking? That's all feedback and you've learned how to drive with that. Well, with this, you get zero. So what you do is artificially generate that. We generate that friction. When you turn, you want the effort to go up as you turn. It, it's not a, just one force to turn it, the force increases the more you turn, just like what happened on, in the vehicle. So that's, you, you know, calibrated to give you that increased force as you, as you articulate the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. So you can see this, this mechanism has to be added in order to make a, a steer by wire system. Very interesting, and I noticed the blue connectors to it, so it's a 48 volt system. Yeah, and if I were to guess, this system's gonna be 48 volts. You know, if you're gonna do any of them, you surely would wanna do this one, because there's you know, high power demand on it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you can, in fact, that was one of the questions, hey, is that a 48 volt? And said, yep, how do you know? It's blue, <laughs> yeah, that really works well. So. Let's, uh, let's go look at the yeah. other side of this thing, kind of the business end, sure thing. And, and see how it looks. Okay. From here, you can see the front suspension, and you can see the, the steering tie rod that comes out to the front of the knuckle. So there's a rack, like a normal rack and pinion that you've known and loved for, for a long time. So it gets a signal and runs an electric motor, which bends the pinion and steers the rack. Except that I see two motors. Except you see two motors. So, and know, that's got to be redundancy? I think that's what this is. I think A safety matter. So if one of these craps out, you got another one. Yeah. I, I because steering that. is, yeah. you don't want to lose the right. steering. Now when we do the total teardown, we'll be looking at the circuitry and the control, you know, and, and, and we'll be able to prove how is that really working. Uh, but to me, you know, standing here, that's, uh, that's your, your failure mode effect. Uh, this is as if one fails, I can't lose steering. I have a redundant backup mm -hmm. motor. So with this system, you have the motor underneath the column to give you the tactile feel, and now you have two motors up here. Cool. So at the end of the day, you're replacing that intermediate shaft with all these motors. <laughs> and so it'll be interesting. <laughs> a little more complicated. Do the whole, uh, whole right. analysis and see you know, where's, yeah. the, where's the cost, where's the benefit. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, a lot of the benefit, four-wheel steer, and especially on a big truck like this, man, I, I love four-wheel steering. I think it's fabulous. Yeah. I, I'd love to see it on every vehicle, as a yeah. matter of fact. Yeah. Maybe not little, you know, short wheelbase ones, but so what's the rear like? Yeah, and, and to your point, it is four-wheel steer, and so that the rear does steer, you know, by wire, always has, in, in, when we've tried to implement it. Not always. There have been other mechanically driven rear steers, but... Uh, typically now, because again, the failure mode effect isn't so egregious. If you were to lose that system, it either defaults to straight, or the worst is you dog track your way safe down to the, uh, to the service station. But uh, because we have it, and again, the, now we, we, we bring the front in and integrate those two systems. You want to see the, yeah, the yeah, rear yeah. steer? Let's take a look. With the rear, again, you have a, a, a steering rack and there is a motor that, that spins it. So we can send a signal, it says I want to turn left, I want to turn right, move that rack. And you can see the uh, tie rods that come down, the control rods, out to the knuckle and can help spin it. Right now there's quite an angle, that, but that's because it's up on the hoist right. and the suspension is you know, fully down. But. So this is uh, relatively simple. You don't have the redundant motors back here, you just have the one. No, it's a, I'm, 
it's kind of slick in the sense, I mean, it's a complicated system, but you don't have to have any shaft between the two or anything like that. You just run a wire to this and you get your, yep. your rear steer. Yep. Now, through the controllers, uh, they have been able to do some, uh, you know, some development and, and, and tuning to the system. Uh, I remember last time when we were driving, we talked about the kind of inherent difficulty with a long wheelbase vehicle with rear wheel steer. And if you're parked between two vehicles and you just make a sharp turn to get out of there uh, and you're used to a normal wheelbase vehicle and you do that, you stand a good chance of clipping the vehicle next to you. So uh, what you'd like to do is hold that uh, steering angle input off for a little bit. Let me go about a half a truck's length. Just to and get out of the parking just spot. Just so I'm, and I'm far enough out and now start dialing in my So you don't clobber the, do the vehicles next to So that's next just to you. You know, an algorithm to build in to help that. And, uh, and we, we've uh, demonstrated that out in a lot. Yeah. You can kind of see how that works. It's, uh, it's kind of neat. Uh, when we uh, put the quadrastere at GM, that was one of the features that we, we designed in to mm -hmm. keep chief engineers from hitting the cars that they were parked <laughs> next to. So you've got another cyber truck here. Let, let's get that up on the hoist and, and yep. see these the steering in action. Yeah, you can, you can, uh, we can see it as, as we actually put it through its motion. Oh, and uh, before we do that, we can take a quick shot here. Here is the battery this that is, you took out. This is the, uh, this is the center of attention here. This is the battery, 800 volt uh, battery system. With uh, the castings as you for the see, front seat. I mentioned that the, the seat riders were actually castings. And so they're, they're, this is the position that they would be in. Um, the, the battery can be dressed, it can have carpet on, it can have wiring harnesses. You can see a ribbon wire connector that's, uh, that's there. The, the penthouse uh, battery control in the back. And again, uh, relatively straightforward from a connectivity, a cooling and electrical yeah. circuit. Well, I can't wait to see once you guys tear into this battery, what you find out. Yeah. Well, this indestructible yellow plastic uh, cable keeps us away from it until it's uh, totally uh, discharged. discharged. Yeah. And we do. We discharge the batteries before uh, we disassemble, and then we put shunting cables on to keep them from regrowing a charge. So, What do, what do you mean, regrow a charge? Uh, some of these, by their chemistry, you can discharge them, and, and they can rebuild some no charge kidding. up. Yeah, you think it's totally Whoa. discharged, and it's not, so you can be for a little surprise. I never knew that. Uh, so there's a shunting mechanism, which doesn't allow that to happen. Hmm. So we discharge them, we shunt them, and then we treat them as if they're fully charged. And that combination has served us well. <laughs> you know, I don't want anybody to get, uh, get hurt around. John, before we go to the other truck, let me just point a couple little things out to you here yeah, that I found sure interesting. Can. If you look, uh, there are some things that I would say are in the, uh, the launch quality category. Launching a vehicle is always extremely difficult. And then, you know, as we look at these vehicles, you can find them, you know, a, a simple example. If you look at the seal and how it should be wrapped, you know, over here, but you can see that it gets puckered here. You can see that it's, it's bulbs and, and pops out over here. So these are areas that they have to try to refine these, the, the, both the product and the process in, in how to assemble it. So you'll see these pop up uh, along the way, but. Now, is that an assembly line worker thing? Yeah. Oh, it is, okay. So yeah. it, it's not a problem with the seal itself, it's just the way it was put in? Well. Yeah, it depends. Right? <laughs> the seal could be hard to put in or by design or it could go in easily, but someone's moving fast or they got a new person on the line or they're just learning the, the system. Right. But you can see how, how it's been done here. Right. There was another interesting observation in that the front door is open, um, a, a nice large opening, but the rears actually open up about 90 degrees. So when you open the rear doors, they really have a wide swing. Noticed on this truck though that this door opened 90 degrees, but that one didn't. It only opened like the fronts do. So what in the world? Why would one open, not the other? Well, when you look at the difference in the hinge, you can see how this is scalloped out so that when this hinge moves, it allows it to go that far. Where the front isn't scalloped like that, and it only allows it to go this far. Well, we find out that that top hinge is one of these, not one of these. Operator error, so they put in the wrong the hinge. Wrong part, the wrong hinge was installed. So again, is, is it pokey oaked? Is it, you know, is it error proofed? 
is the process you know, really ironed out? These are the types of things that all manufacturers struggle to launch, but Tesla obviously has their, their challenges and you can see some of them here. All right. Let's look in the back of the truck. This is, I think, pretty interesting as well. Because the, the mega casting story continues to grow. Uh, you can see this very large rear casting. That is a here. gigantic it's, casting. It's I mean, gigantic. no wonder they call it Giga, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. You know, if, and if you look where they came with the Model Y rear casting to what we're doing now, it's, it's huge. And then these buttresses, these big castings that, uh, that are attached to it even here. So it could, all the structure going in this fashion. You can see the air cylinder for the air suspension here. And again, the, the castings are painted. They're coated yeah, in some way. The, you can see where they, where they have a coating on them. Interesting. Okay, look. These, these uh, timbre doors, by the way, in order to get these things out, like even the battery, this, this tonneau cover has to come off. Well, it takes a doctorate degree to get one of these things out. It is really hard. In fact, uh, in the typical service, there's a, a fixture that comes in the back and you unroll the whole top into a fixture that rolls away and then you can feed it back in when you're wow. done. So uh, otherwise, I understand it comes in a lot of little pieces. <laughs> one of those learning events. Well, cool. Let's look at uh, the one that's up on the yeah, hoist and see what the thing. steering's all about there. John, one of the, uh, the anomalies of an electric vehicle, you can hear the pump. Yeah. Batteries are like people. They don't like to be hot and they don't like to be cold. And so the thermal management of the battery and, and the motors and the power electronics is always demanding some type of thermal management. Interesting. So, so you can hear right now. I, I can hear it. I don't know if the mic's picking it up, but I can yeah. hear the, the yeah. buzz or the hum of yeah. a, a pump. And so it's not, uh, it's not unusual to walk in your garage and you hear this <laughs> and go, what's going on here? And you realize, oh, this is my vehicle. It's keeping yourself warm. Interesting. Even though we're inside a building and anything, it, it yeah. just defaults to be doing warm that. Because huh? they brought it in. And so, you know, whatever preconditioning it had. But interesting. it's interesting when we walked up, I thought, ah, oh, I, can, I yeah. can hear it running. It never misses my attention. Okay, so uh, well, let's we, see how far we're going to show steer. here on, on, the, uh, on the hoist is, uh, you know, both the front steer and the rear steer and, and, and how they behave with this respect to each other. The, uh, the vehicle is designed that at slow speeds, the front and rear will turn out of phase. So they'll turn one opposite one way each and other, the opposite, which shortens your your turning radius considerably. As you go into higher speeds, that changes from out of phase to in phase. So and that's as what, you're doing lane changes, and yeah, you're doing, it, it limits thirty how much miles time. an hour. Well, or something, do you know? Fifteen miles an hour come to mind. Okay. And we're trying to experiment with doing it, but I don't want them to go too fast on the hoist here for various <laughs> reasons. I'd like it not to go through the, the other wall here. Yeah. Um, you know, want to be safe. So we're trying to do it out on the road where we can make observations from the side. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually around 15, 20 miles an hour, you'll be, because if you go from out of phase to in phase, you have to go through zero somewhere. And that's an interesting uh, place to see. But if we, you start right now, uh, we had to learn how to trick it to do this because the first time we tried to do this, it won't steer when it's on a hoist because it thinks it's being jacked and it, it, it doesn't steer. So the guys figured out a way to, to shift it into a, a mode to where, now you can see where the, the rear is turning. Front is out to the right, rear is out to the left. That's interesting that you got to get the wheels turning before the steering will actually work. Well, and in, in Oh, what did you have to do, Derek? It turns. Got it figured out. Oh, interesting. Yeah. At first we couldn't, but now it, it looks like it steers quite well. So there was something that was in a, in a jack tire jack mode or something at first when we were doing this and it wouldn't do it. No. So as long as you have your foot on the brake, it will it'll turn. But if you took your foot off the brake, it'll stop steering? No, it still steering. Oh, it still does. Okay. So they don't have to be turning. No, no. But the, again, the first time we tried it, it wouldn't work. But you know, there's funny things that this thing does, like when you jack up a tire, the suspension, the air suspension has to know, oh, I'm being jacked. And therefore I shouldn't try to inflate this thing 
feel, I'm fighting you, you're trying to get this thing up and I'm trying to put the tire down, you know? So there's tricky things you gotta do to, uh, to put all this together and there, there was some interaction with the steering here. But this is a good uh, view, you can see how much it's turning with respect to each That's other. Right. That's right. Well, Terry, this is fascinating and I know you guys are going to tear into this even more. You know, we'll be able to come back, look at the actual components. I'm sure you're going to do uh, an analysis of the whole system, how yep. it all works, and we'll get that too. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. Well, this is... Uh, I'd like to have you back in a little bit here where you can see the parts laid out further and we get the yep. other system in and the 48 volt system all laid out. So, let's see how that, how that works. It's a deal. We'll be back. Okay. Thanks again.